Okay. <clears throat> My name is Robert Franklin. I'm conducting an oral history interview with James Bates on October 3rd, 2017. The interview is being conducted on the campus of Washington State University, Tri-Cities. I'll be talking with Jim about his experiences working at the Hanford site. And for the record, can you state and spell your full name for us? Okay. Uh, James M. Bates and J-A-M-E-S B-A-T-E-S. Okay, great. <laughs> it's not difficult. <laughs> no, but you, you, you just, you never know. Um, so tell me, uh, so you're, you're from the area, yep. right? Okay, so my usually my first question is tell me how and why you came to the area, but you were, you were born. I was born in Pasco, went to school in Kennewick, graduated from Kennewick High in 1970. Uh, my dad, when I was in junior high school, brought me out to the Battelle Northwest groundbreaking ceremony. Okay. My dad was involved in local politics quite a bit. In fact, he eventually became mayor of Kennewick for several years. And uh, But he got me interested in the lab when we came out to the ground banking ceremony and the discussions of what was going to be going on in the labs kind of caught my interest. And uh, I mean, I was in junior high, so it, <laughs> mm. it was a long time to change my mind. But I kind of stuck with that uh, as, my, as my goal. And... Uh, Graduated uh, high school, went up to WSU, joined the mechanical engineering department, uh, got my degree, got a job offer from Battelle, came to work one month after graduation, stayed here 35 years. Oh. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so did, did your father work for Hanford or was he just No, he of... well, he was uh, back right after he got out of high school, back in the late 40s, he worked on construction of some of the, the uh, waste tank storage, the single shell tanks. Oh, okay. He worked out there about two years, uh, but uh, he eventually got diverted into auto parts and managed the Napa store in downtown Kennewick. And okay. So that's where I worked in the summers doing inventory. And <coughs> <coughs> I'm fighting a cough right now, so. Oh, sure. But. Um, and so what, what was your first job when you came out to Patel? Well, um, they they had what they called in those days the science and engineering rotation program. It was uh, okay. where you hired in and spent three to six months in various departments where they had openings. And uh, I actually started in the uh, facilities department. Uh, good bunch of guys there, still friends with a lot of those guys. And I uh, worked there about four months, and it gave me a real good chance to to learn what the lab was all about. I I was modifying facilities for various uh, sections, groups, departments, and as project needs changed. So I got to know a whole lot of people around the lab. And one of the, one of the departments that caught my uh, attention was the uh, fluids engineering section. And uh, when they had an opening, I transferred in there and stuck with them for 34 more years. So. Wow. So I'm wondering if you can, um, just because I'm kind of a layman when it comes to this, you could describe to me what, what is fluids engineering, fluids dynamics? Well, uh, understanding fluid flow, phase change, uh, pressure drops, uh, Newtonian and non Newtonian fluid behaviors, uh, like I mentioned, multi phase flow, all of that played very much into the understanding the. Uh, water cooling aspects of our production reactors out here. Okay. And in fact, I got on board when they were trying to upgrade NPR, or the, the new production reactor, which was actually N reactor. Okay. And uh, we were trying to bump the, uh, the performance, the thermal output of that reactor, as well as the production capability. So we had uh, a chance to refurbish a lot of the old thermal hydraulic loops that were used for designing the fuels on the old production reactors, the B, C, D reactors. Uh, we upgraded that facility and began to do a number of tests related to the N reactor and uh, critical heat flux correlations, uh, these sorts of things, which helped them improve the fuel design for the reactor. So, so if I'm understanding, so you, you kind of drew on the work done to increase the productivity of the single pass reactors yep. and, and transfer yeah. that to the, the closed yeah. loop system of the end reactor? Yeah, I mean, uh, we did work, factory did work on some of the work on the steam generators used that were 
eventually used to power the uh, the civilian power plant out there. So, but our, I mean, the, the this test loop go, chases its roots way back to the before I was born, 1950, 51. They had loops out there to help them with reactor design. Uh, they kind of fell by the wayside in terms of use until we refurbished them and got them back online. But it, it, it was, we had a high pressure loop out there capable of full reactor conditions, 2,500 PSI, 650 degrees. We had five megawatts of power available to us uh, through both uh, rectifiers and motor generator sets. We used electrically resistance heating to simulate the nuclear uh, fuel rod bundle uh, thermal output. So, uh, okay. so uh, it was quite interesting for a young guy just out of school, used to working on tabletop scale experiments. I mean, this, the, this loop was 100 feet long and 100 feet high, and <laughs> I mean, it was pretty impressive to me. So. And, where, where, and this was located at the, on the, at the old, campus? Uh, no, this is out of the 189D area. It was a reactor support building in the, in the D area complex. Okay. So, so it involved a, a. When I was out there sitting in my chair at uh, at the loop, I was 50 miles from home. It was quite a long commute. Yeah, so. and so that by this point, um, well, the single pass reactors were shut down. Mm, pretty not or, or, not completely. Okay. Uh, there there were you know there were the, they were getting into those issues of thermal output and getting state permits and. Uh, I can remember one time, in fact, we lost our permit to even do the therm thermal discharge from our test loop in the middle of a critical program. So how are we going to cool this thing without any river water at our disposal? Okay. So what we came up with, we pumped the river water out, one passed through our loop, stored it in the old uh, emergency cooling tanks out there that were in the 190 tank building. Gave us five million gallons of uh, capacity to store until we got our discharge permit back. And then, then we opened the valve and let it back out. So. Oh, it's to return the water. To, <laughs> to the, the return the water back to the river. Yeah. Was that permitting process kind of part of the the growing environmental? Oh yeah, and, much, and very much so. I mean, uh, when I first hired on, uh, Hanford kind of had free reign on what we could do out here. We didn't even pay for power. I mean, I'd, I'd fire up five megawatts of power supply and there was no meter on it. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have wanted to pay that bill, but... <laughs> yeah, right. Where, and where was that power coming from? Well, it was coming off the, the grid out here on the site. Okay. And we used it to... We had a big motor generator set. To, I forget how many horsepower it was, like 200 horsepower that we used to turn... AC power into DC, DC power being much better for this electrical resistance heating that we're doing. And we also had silicon control, silicon control rectifiers, SCRs we call them, that uh, about four megawatts of power out of that unit that turned AC power into controllable DC power. So I, I remember every time we had to come online, I had to call the guys at the substations, they we're throwing the breaker, we're, uh, get ready, we're coming online. Because if, if we didn't give them warning, it, it looked like something was failing and we'd shut the shut the substation down. So. Oh, because you would, because of the it's a big power draw power all of a sudden, right? Draw. Okay, <laughs> that, was, that would look like a, a massive. Some kind of a surge going on that was unexpected. So we had the phone number pasted on the wall there before you throw the switch, call these guys and let them know we're coming online. So uh, it was, uh, when, when that motor generator set was running, it was pretty impressive. Uh, sounded like a jet engine running just off to the side of the control panel here. Wow. In fact, I think that's why I have hearing loss over <laughs> sitting there next to that thing for so many hours. Sure. So yeah, I bet there'd be a different industrial hygiene. Oh well, we didn't have any we didn't have any noise surveys in those days when when they did come when our, our health people finally came out and did a survey. Uh, he said, man, that's about 108, 110 decibels. You shouldn't be spending more than two hours a day in that environment. And I says, well, let's see, I'm 14 hours and going for today. So. Yeah. That's, that's really loud. <laughs> oh, it is. It is really loud. I mean, we, we sat there with hearing protection on just to keep from getting a headache. But there was no requirements uh, for limits of exposure or how many hours we could spend in that environment. So. Wow. I'm wondering if you could talk about how the... The, that permitting, that level of um, kind of safety and permitting um, increased during your time out oh, there. Oh, it, it was orders of magnitude. Uh, 
basically, in, when I first hired on, in fact, I, I brought the documents. We wrote our safety documents, and we ran them, you know, basically our operating procedures and what the hazards were, and that we wrote that all down, and we got it approved by Gordy Halseth. Uh, he was the single safety officer, officer for Battelle at that in those days. He and a couple of secretaries and clerks. I mean, if you go out and compare that to the size of the safety department that's out there now, I mean, there must probably 50, 60 people now doing that same job just because of the increasing requirements. But basically, in those days, we invite Gordy out and give him, a, give him a tour and get him to buy off and one signature and we were on our way. So, uh, and uh, I mean, this, this stuff we were doing, I mean, this, this is 2,500 PSI, 650 degrees is dangerous. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, we, we were careful because we knew it was dangerous, not because somebody told us we had to be careful. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, if some, somebody tells you that stove's hot, you don't touch it. I mean, you don't have to have it written down somewhere and sign off on a procedure. So, uh, and, uh, but yeah, the, the changes that went on increased uh, the efforts required to get project plans approved, safety documents approved, hazardous materials documents approved, all of this, uh, it became a much larger fraction of what we had to do in order to do our experimental work. So uh, I got a little frustrated with it towards the end of my, my career because it was just taking so much time. And uh, the, the ultimate objective, as stated by our safety people, was zero accidents. Uh, I kept saying there's no such thing. Uh, probabilities play in and you know things are going to happen uh, I told them I the people working for me the most dangerous thing they do all day is drive to work statistically sure so I said do you want me to tell them to stay home and well that's not what we're after mm -hmm. so. <laughs> could you see on, on the flip side though could, could you see any tangible um, benefit to, to that to that oh yeah I mean you know the, the if you read the old records of how much we the production reactors warmed up the river, for example. I mean, when all of the production reactors were online, they could warm the entire Columbia River up by four to five degrees, which when you go out there and watch that river flowing by, that's pretty amazing. Uh, right, and, and that, could, that could have some real cascading effects oh, on, yeah, yeah. on different, on um, the whole and, and of know, course, the ecosystem. Yeah, and you mentioned the ones through cooling. I mean, uh, when a fuel element ruptured, uh, you began to wonder what was going into the river. So, <laughs> and, uh, so what, what other kinds of uh, improvements or changes did your work lead to with the with the with the reactor single pass and then the closed loop? Oh, we've we uh, for example we worked on the uh, the uh, improving the pressure drop performance of the spacers that hold the reactor rod bundles together. I mean, anytime you got a pressure drop through there, it's a loss of energy essentially. So we were trying to improve the performance of the spacer and the mixing behaviors downstream of those spacers. Because if, 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 if the flow characteristics aren't proper and you don't get proper cooling to the rod, you'll get a hot spot and that limits how much you can ramp the power up. So, so the, both the physical and the, the, the fluid dynamics of, of that flow, it's very important to how much power you can get out of a fuel element. So. Okay. So that, we worked on that a lot. Uh, in fact, these pictures I've got show huge uh, uh, control panels where pressure drop was the, what we were measuring. And uh, we used to use old mercury manometers in those days. <laughs> what, what, what is that? Yeah, uh, it's a, where you measure like a, for example, a barometer where you made it, the old mercury barometers used to measure atmospheric pressure mm. by how far the, it pushed a, 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 a mercury column up in a tube. Well, if you put uh, high side pressure, low side pressure, and see the difference in that, you can determine how many PSI pressure top. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, the, uh, the electronic transducers were just beginning, beginning to come on the market, uh, which we eventually replaced all of that with. But, uh, and what, is that just something that electronically measures? Yeah, yeah. Measures I mean, pressure? It, yeah, you, they use uh, 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 Piezoelectrics, for example, is one way of making a pressure uh, sensor. And uh, we got, I got to live through all of that where we went from manually recording uh, manometers on a, on a 
panel into our logbook to tie it into a uh, Apple computer-based data acquisition system and uh, doing it all electronically. So uh, you got to remember when I went to work out there in 1974, there were no desktop computers. Uh, right. I, my slide rule got a workout the first couple of years. <laughs> so, and then, and then eventually the company came through and gave us all HP calculators, and, uh, oh, right. which uh, were just beginning to come onto the market. So, how, how did that change your work? Oh, that, that just that one tool, that one tool change drastically. Uh, as as an, an old school engineer, the thing I noticed uh, comparing it to the the young engineers coming on board. When you work with a slide rule, you have to keep basically order of magnitude answers in your head. I mean, the decimal point doesn't show on a slide rule. So you, you got real good at anticipating what a, a reasonable answer is to an engineering problem. The young engineers that were coming in that were all digital and computer, they come in and show me an answer. and It was off by four orders of magnitude. I said, that can't be. There's no heat transfer coefficient that high. There's, you know... <laughs> You gotta, you gotta keep in your mind what a reasonable answer is, and uh, I'm afraid that that tendency is still exists today in our computer-based uh, engineering world. So, so, so you're saying then that that kind of precision of the calculator took away some of that like educated guesswork. It took away that, uh, like I said, the uh, the engineering judgment. Okay. You start believing all the numbers the computer spits out with no basis to re reject them as reasonable or unreasonable. And uh, it, some of the, the older engineers I worked with, like uh, Dale Fitzsimmons and Frank Zolodek and that, these guys were out there working about the time I was born. Uh, they had the ability to do on a, on a back of an envelope, so, so to speak, very good calculations. Uh, things that we wouldn't even attempt to do today. Obviously, they were approximations, but they gave us design parameters so we could go out and buy pumps and, and things to, to do the job. And uh, we just didn't have all that software. <laughs> In fact, uh, the very first computer that was used out here was an analog computer that used manual jumpers on an array of resistors. Wow. Uh, it, it was very crude, but because there's an electrical analog for heat transfer, you could mock up a heat transfer experiment electronically okay. and uh, get some basic answers which we always had to confirm experimentally so uh, how long did that practice continue of, of generating basic answers to then confirm well I mean it, it, right up to the time I retired we were still doing uh, very detailed studies on uh, turbulence I mean turbulence is something computer models can't model very well Every, okay. every turbulence model out there is, uh, is uh, uh, empirically derived from experimental data. There's no first principles that can model, model the chaos of turbulence. Sure. And that's very key to heat transfer, for example. So even with uh, some of the, uh, the reactor design codes that are being used now, which other group people in our group were responsible for developing, the Cobra codes, the Viper codes, these probably don't mean anything to you, but the, if in the nuclear industry they're key to to designing and and uh, analyzing accident conditions and so forth, a lot of the empirical models that are in those codes came from our experimental work. And uh, are, the, are those acronyms? Yeah. Cobra yeah. And yeah. Uh, Cobra. I'm trying to coolant uh, boiling and reactor accidents. I, I've got it. It's in the. Sure. It's in the old history documents here. <laughs> they became words to us over the years. You kind of lose right. track of where, where they came from. This may sound like an off-the-wall question. I'm just kind of curious. We have a, a I found a box of archival material the other day that referenced something called a called a Trump computer program. Yeah, I remember you, Trump. Okay, yeah. I'm wondering that if was you a, could, that, that well, wasn't well, something I was familiar with, oh, but okay. it was competitive with some of the things we were developing. Okay. okay. Uh, I, our our group over the years split and merged many times, but we always had a, an analytical branch and an experimental branch. And there was a lot of things that went on during the split in terms of, of code development that we in the experimental group weren't in the meetings with uh, on a daily basis. But, uh, but Why did they split and merge so many times? Oh, it was basically uh, growth and, and uh, 
and uh, when funding grew and it got too unmanageable, there was a logical way to split the group into two management because mm. section leaders couldn't manage 50 people. I mean, that gets a little cumbersome. Right. So we'd split it into two 25-person groups for a while, and then the funding would dry up, and we'd, we'd merge. Uh, we also, as is, did every company in the country, we went through you know, the management style of the day process where we grew management and contracted it. Uh, sure. I, I, someday I, I always want to go back through my org charts and chart how, <laughs> how many management peop, people there were at any given time as a function of time. It changed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I even got uh, in, boy, when was it? Late 80s, I guess. Early 90s, I got asked to manage a group and I, I did that for about four years, but I found that uh, management was a totally different animal than, than the technical work I like to do. So when the opportunity came, when they wanted to merge, I gave up my management position very willingly. So. <laughs> but uh, um, That's great. Uh, so I'm wondering, um, I wonder if you could kind of track or, or tell me how kind of larger national events play a kind of affected your work and I'm oh. thinking of um, the, the kind of drawdown of the Carter administration. Yeah, when, when Jimmy Carter said uh, basically no more nukes, uh, that was a huge transition for us. I was working on a program at the time uh, related to understanding uh, uh, liquid metal breeder reactor uh, natural circulation cooling. Okay. Uh, I'd spent three years designing, building, and getting ready to, to run tests on this very specialized test section. Uh, we, were, we were some of the country's experts at that time in laser Doppler anemometry, which is a, an optical technique to measure fluid flow. And so can, you, can you say laser Doppler? Yeah, LDA for short, and laser Doppler anemometry. Anemometry. Yes. Okay. Uh, in fact, we've... When I first came on board, we were putting together uh, LDA systems from components we bought from Edmund Scientific. I mean, big lenses and stuff, and we built all the mounts, and it was kind of a do-it-yourself. And we were doing things very unique at the time. And you were using this to measure, because uh, I see on my bio sheet here, you were working with lasers and tools to measure coolant flows. So yes, you, yes. You are measuring heat. And We'd put a mock-up of a reactor inside of a test section with with uh, quartz windows in it and so we could shine through. Uh, I built quartz windows that were good for a thousand PSI of pressure so we could measure at uh, reactor conditions. Wow. Uh, some of the first measurements of that, in fact, in fact, I published a paper on some of this and it got accepted to a, an international symposium in Portugal. That I went over and presented what we were doing. It was pretty neat. I got, I got to put in the bound volume of proceedings. So, wow. uh, it was a, a very fun experience, but LDA was kind of my uh, first love for about 10, 15 years of work. Uh, and in fact, LDA became so popular as a research tool that there were uh, there was several companies started to sell those systems. Uh, Thermal Systems Incorporated, TSI, out of Minneapolis. Uh, they uh, consulted us with us quite a bit on how to improve systems and. Uh, eventually marketed complete operable systems you could buy out of a catalog as opposed to our home built systems. Right. Kind of so. taking what you were doing in industrial or kind of standardizing yep. it or kind of. Yep. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that's really interesting. I mean, who, who doesn't want to work with lasers? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Even today, I think people still. It, it's, it's cool stuff. I mean, I wish I had some of those pictures that. Uh, what, I've been retired 10 years and a lot of my stuff has kind of disappeared, but. Uh, sure. We'd have the photographers come in and take a picture of our uh, all the mirrors and lenses and things we had lined up on a, a layout table to uh, make this LDA system work, and it was pretty neat stuff. So, so I want to go. I'll just ask you. Uh, so the uh, LMBR, the Liquid Metal. So you you were doing work then to support the FFT. Yeah, and then Jimmy Carter said no more. Well, yeah. in a matter of three days, I went from fully funded for st three straight years on this program to having zero dollars. They called and said, end a program, box it up and send it off. Uh, most of it went to excess, some of it got transferred to a, another lab. 
and I had to find something new to do. So one week later, I went from working on liquid metal breeding reactors to working on solar energy storage. Uh, that's quite a that seems it was, like it was traumatic to me <laughs> and our whole group uh, underwent a similar transition uh, how, how can you move to solar energy storage that was popular in those days uh, alternative energy price of oil was creeping up still uh, is though kind of right I mean, well it's still very interesting uh, a lot of these things we were the first to look at them as as alternatives some of those now are becoming standard grid power uh, solar cells for example that was a little our, our fluids group didn't work on the solar uh, cells area pretty much that's the electronics people but we were working on uh, uh, solar concentrator mirrors and developing uh, uh, proper th fluids to circulate through those things capture the thermal energy run it through a turbine and produce power and, oh wow uh, did, so. did that Research ever amount to any? Oh, any there, there. I mean, application? there were there were experimental facilities uh, around the country that utilized that technology. Oh. I don't think it ever got to as large a scale as uh, some of the solar uh, cell farms that are uh, exist now. You know, they got five megawatt farms, ten megawatt farms. Uh, the solar salt pond concept that we were working on was a good idea, but it had a lot of technical difficulties. Sure. And uh, one of them being materials, I mean, that those brines are very tough to contain, uh, very corrosive, and the materials get very expensive very fast. Oh. You gotta use the, you know, stainless steel isn't good enough, you gotta go to the Inconel nickel-based metals, and pretty soon the economics don't make sense. So right, you can do it in the laboratory. You can do it in the lab, but the scale-up process is uh, difficult. Right. So, uh, so you, you mentioned that you used um, LDA for, for 10 to 15 years or so. I'm yeah. kind of wondering what, what came after that or what did... Well, like I said, once they commercialized those systems and uh, we, we did a lot of work for Electric Power Research Institute, which was a consortium of utilities to how to improve reactor performance, improve safety. And this was for energy reactors? Yes, right? yes okay. these are energy, commercial reactors. Commercial right? reactors. So we, we got very much involved in on the uh, non-government side of reactor research. Uh, at the time, Battelle had a contract that allowed us to do not only work for the government, but work for the for the private side, what we called our 1831 contract. Right, yeah, I'm familiar with yeah. that number. So, uh, we could go out and sell to, I mean, we, we actually marketed to the various reactor vendors to do research with these tools that we developed primarily for the production reactors. And uh, we did research for Westinghouse and Babcock and Wilcox and all of, all, most all of the reactor uh, vendors at the time. So uh, it was, it was uh, good, good business. Uh, uh, Worked hard. A lot of when you get on the private side, the the, the budgets are more constrained and the schedules are more are tight. Uh, many a time we put in 24-hour days. Uh, we'd take our sleeping bags out to D area and grab two-hour cat naps as we were. Oh, wow. So, you, so you were still working out in D area then? In, in uh, was this would have been in the, the 80s and 90s? Or? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. uh, up until I forget when we closed the building there. We. Uh, they told us they were going to knock down the starting the the, the the site reclamation process, and we ha we had to get out. Uh, I won't wrote many a letter to say these are very valuable tools you're throwing away, and they will never be recreated because they're too expensive now. But it fell on deaf ears, and uh, we basically walked away from that facility. We did recreate some test facilities in the 336 building and 300 area. Uh, there was a big high bay building that was left over from the days of, uh, of the fast flux test facility. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was responsible for building a big uh, waste tank storage simulation facility in 336 building where we started developing tools to monitor uh, tank levels and tank mixing uh, and uh, tank retrieval. Uh, we tested some of these robotic concepts for going in and retrieving tank waste, which are, are being used now. Uh, I mean, the tank retrieval going on right now has a, uh, a lot of technologies that we, we investigated at 
in the 336 building uh, at a reduced scale. So, uh, oh. so that it's pretty rewarding to see some of that stuff. Uh, also, uh, vit plant. We were in on the early days of the of the mixing concerns in the tanks related to the vit plant and and uh, the treatment of the tank waste. Uh, for example, the pulse jet mixer problem, which is still very much in the news, uh, holding up portions of the design. We did a lot of pulse jet mixer studies in uh, 336 building. And uh, I, I, I read these technical articles that are still coming out and they're still doing some of the very same things I was doing back in the late 90s. Right. The, these problems are very difficult. Yeah. Uh, nobody's ever tried to mix fluids of the kind we've got out in these tanks. Right. Very Different. complex. Yeah, I, I, I don't know a, a lot. What I know is that there there's many different um, uh, characteristics. Oh. Like there's there's solids and semi-solids. Yep. They all have very different. They behave with what they call non-Newtonian fluids. Okay. Uh, and when you start worrying about transporting non-Newtonian non fluids and transporting a solids fraction in that fluid, like the the you know the plutonium particle particles and other uh, radioisotope particles, these things settle out in the wrong places, you got problems. Right. So, uh, and they're all going to react, and a lot of these things will react to heat in different oh, ways. The, chem well, I, the, the tanks, we used to refer to them as a, a periodic chart soup. I mean, they've got a little everything in them. <laughs> so, <laughs> and just the, just the characterization of that waste is a very difficult problem. Sure. Uh, you mean how to... Open understand the chemistry go that's in. going on and yeah. yeah I mean you probably remember the SY 101 tank was the hydrogen generation problem uh, that's something that we worked on I'm not, I'm actually I'm not familiar with that I'm wondering oh if you tell me about it's that. one of the old uh, double shell tanks uh, they started noticing that the the uh, level was going up on occasion uh, and then it would go back down well what was happening is due to a chemical process and thermolysis they call it uh, hydrogen was being generated in rather large bubbles in that tank waste and when the bubble got big enough it would burst to the top the headspace in the tank would go above the flammability limit for hydrogen oh. and if there were a spark from whatever source you could have a rather major disaster you so, have a tank blow up <laughs> Which did happen in Russia. I mean, if you, I don't know if you've ever read any of their, uh, they well, had some they, incidents like that. Yeah, they, they had a major incident in um, in the fifties, right? Or yeah, was, that, yeah, where they had. I a, don't know exact date, but they had. Yeah, a, where a tank, uh, they were cool. They ruptured tank a tank. Yes. yes, and it, it was uh, it killed a lot yeah. of people. And well, of course, when we found out when DOE found out that they had these hydrogen events in these waste tanks, it was all hands on deck. We got to solve this problem. And right, because uh, we'll have we'll likely have the same. Right. So a lot of our computer models got diverted to modeling that situation. We on the experimental side got uh, excited about coming up with mitigation techniques. How can we improve the mixing? How can we prevent this hydrogen bubble buildup problem? And uh, that consumed us for a number of years. So. Yeah. Did 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 you was it solved? What's that? What's oh yeah, S Y one hundred one was eventually solved, and uh, the the hydrogen release problem was uh, mitigated. What, what what was the solution? Well, I think I think term. you know you're going back really testing my memory okay. here now, but uh, probably better to read some of the technical reports on this. But sure. you know they they did a lot of transfers in and out of the tank, add liquid bring mixed tanks from, or contents of several tanks, get the chemistry to a more acceptable condition, okay. and improve the monitoring and the mixing. And uh, they basically got it to where the hydrogen is still being generated, but it wasn't being stored and released in these periodic events, which can lead to, you know, if you, you save up the hydrogen for a couple of months and release it all in a single event, the concentration goes up drastically. Sure. But we came up with mixing techniques that allowed it to do a slow release and keep the concentrations down. So, so it's still building hydrogen, but oh, yeah. it's not in these massive well, bubbles. Well, that, and that, then that uh, thermal generation of hydrogen is always going to happen. Uh, the chemistry is 
can't be changed, but you got to prevent it from building up to to concentrations of concern. So, yeah. hydrogen generation is a problem they're dealing with in building the VIT plant. They don't want any in incidents like that be occurring anywhere in the process lines of the VIT plant. So, because right. uh, they have heat there, you, oh, yeah. you could conceivably. Well, get yeah. That well, you, well, the 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 you don't have to necessarily heat it. I mean, these isotopes self-heat, so sure. <laughs> uh, they they will generate hydrogen. So. Uh, so that, wow. that is very much on the radar screens of everybody doing design work now. But we were in on the early days when the when the uh, problem first came to light. So uh, now, now did that problem? Uh, sorry, you mentioned this, did that problem come to light be because of discoveries that came because of discoveries here at Hanford, not because of the Russian? Well, I mean, that, or was it kind of? A, was it? Did they kind the of? Rush, the Russians didn't publicize much of what was going on. I mean, right, they right. didn't write technical papers that we could reference. Uh, so, it was a problem that was understood. I mean, the chemistry and the the the, the generation of hydrogen was understand understood, but the the physical characteristics of the waste and how it could retain this hydrogen in, in bubbles, that was all pretty new stuff. Okay. Uh, we had to understand the mechanisms by which, which it was happening before we could go about coming up with a fix to prevent it from happening. Sure, so, sure. Uh, uh, so it took a lot of, there was a lot of what I call grade five engineering going on out there to understand these problems. We had chemists and physicists and and engineers all collaborating on a daily basis to what's going on here, and uh, we got to solve this problem, and it it can't wait. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. um, I'm wondering if uh, I'd like to ask you about a couple more events, um, how they impacted you, or or if they did. I'm wondering, did you ever work on any of the the, the whoops reactors, or do any work for whoops? Or oh, for, I for did work and... for them. We we did some. Uh, for example, I, I was in the routine business for a while doing flow meter calibrations, and they have a lot of large flow meters out there. Uh, so we had a, out at 189D, we had what it called our low pressure loop with very large pumps, and we could do flow meter calibrations there in the lab up to a couple thousand GPM. So what's, what's a GP, what's GP? Gallons per minute. Oh, okay. And in fact, at one time, we did a flow meter calibration for the city of Los Angeles that we needed a million gallons per minute. And we fired up a couple of the old uh, K-reactor river pumps. And this flow meter was in a pipe that was six and a half feet in diameter. And wow. <laughs> it was, this was large-scale engineering. And uh, actually did a flow meter calibration for the city of Los Angeles so they'd know how much water they were pumping into their uh, domestic water supply system. So. So we, we got we got involved in all kinds of little tangents because of the capabilities we had. So I'm wondering how um, Chernobyl affected uh, you the site. <laughs> uh, in my mind, Chernobyl was the beginning of the end for uh, graphite moderated reactors. Uh, that that was the emphasis was on shutting those things down. Right. Um, and that's what was yeah. at Hanford. I, I lived through Chernobyl, and I lived through. Th I was on working when Three Mile Island happened. And, oh, uh, right. I I got to go back and visit Three Mile Island about three four months after it happened, and, uh, and, wh and why was that? trying to understand how that happened. And uh, as you know, I think it finally uh, boiled down to rea operator error. Right. Uh, they closed some valves that shouldn't have been closed because they didn't understand the thermal hydraulics of the reactor. Uh, so once we understood that and could simulate it with, with our codes, they started doing extensive training on, to operators so they understood how all this worked, trained their whole, uh, changed their whole training procedure for reactor operators and uh, made a big difference. Uh, <laughs> they needed to understand the very the subtleties of what was going on in a reactor. Right. If, if, if the operators had got up and walked off, the reactor would have been fine. The automated systems would have done the right thing. They overrode some of those and caused a problem. So, and uh, any, any time that we, we had enough expertise in our group, any time there was a, a reactor problem, we usually got involved. Uh, even uh, the Fukushima 
tsunami damage over there. Some of our people went over and spent time with the Japanese helping them to resolve, look into that problem, what could be done about it. So uh, uh, a lot of history in our group and uh, helping the world with nuclear problems. So. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever get the get to? Did you ever go to Ru to the Ukraine or Russia? No, uh, uh, a good number of our people did. Uh, uh, we uh, certainly got involved with some of our personnel in the uh, the uh, Chernobyl uh, encapsulation project, where mm -hmm. they were trying to you know put the big dome over the reactor and prevent the further spread of the contaminants. And uh, I I forget the name of that project again. There was an acronym, but. Uh, but yeah, our people got involved in that too. Uh, understanding airborne transport of contaminants and particulates, and uh, there's there's still efforts going on in that area. So right. That yeah. problem is not going away anytime soon. <laughs> how did um, how did the transition between uh, production and then the signing of the Tri Party and the beginning of cleanup? How how did that affect your your research and your well we had a lot of good tools developed uh, I mean a fluid is a fluid and nuclear waste is a very interesting fluid uh, just trying to come up with simulants for it is uh, very difficult we spent we spent years trying to develop uh, formulations that can in a in a cold environment allow us to do testing with properties of fluids that are similar to what the waste exhibits and that's, that's a difficult problem. Uh, many a day we were out there mixing up different batches of waste simulant. It's a very dirty job because it involves a lot of fine particulates and clays. And uh, many a day I came home red dust head to foot. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but we eventually came up with some very good simulants and they're being used not only here on site, but some of the other labs doing similar research. Oh, wow. So uh, those were interesting days too. How how was morale on on site and in that with the ship oh, production uh, to clean up? Obviously, when you put you know, for example, like that project, I put three years of my life, night and day, uh, long we're, days. We're talking about the FFTF. Project. Yeah, where I was working yeah. on the uh, the uh, uh, natural convection cooling of basically an accident condition analysis for LMFBRs. I mean, I. I, I traveled to vendors around the country and worked with them to develop hardware and come up with special pumps and instruments and I designed a, a, a test section with sapphire windows in it. Each of those sapphire windows was $10,000 and I needed like 20 of them. And wow. <laughs> I, I watched those. I only, we installed two or three of those windows and the balance of them got shipped off to excess. I mean, uh, that's, that's not good for morale. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, because <laughs> uh, what we had to have the uh, sapphire because of the frequency of the of the uh, lasers we were using to do the LDA work, and uh, you can't use normal glass or even and quartz wasn't strong enough to stand up to the conditions we were we were testing, so we had oh, to wow. use uh, synthetic sapphire. And, synthetic uh, sapphire. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So I had to work with the vendors to come up with the production techniques and how to machine these into our special shapes. And anyway, I had half a million dollars in hardware that it was ready to run a test, and I never got to run a test. <laughs> so yeah, there were similar stories all around the lab where it was uh, this transition was very difficult. From you mean the the end of the eighties transition? Yes, the end of the, the you know the the. The death of the nuclear industry, so to speak, yeah, and the, of the, the transition. War. Yeah, the end of the. Yeah. As, as some of our folks used to say, once with the Soviet Union proved to be such an unreliable enemy, uh, when when they split up and the wall came down and production became less important, uh, the and the tran the environmental movement, of course, uh, we had to clean up this mess. Uh, that was a transition for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, was, was there a lot of enthusiasm for for this new new job or yeah as we as as you get into it and find out just how complex it is I mean it, it it's not like opening a can of soup I mean it's just you got to understand the problem first and that takes a lot of research and uh, uh, then coming up how we can how we can best simulate it how we can model it both computationally and experimentally mm -hmm. um, 
lot of challenges. So yeah, I bet. <coughs> I'm wondering uh, how how did that um, transition affect the, the Tri Cities as a whole? Well, uh, Tri Cities, you know, has been undergone numerous transitions. Uh, the biggest one was when they shut down the the Whoops reactor construction. Uh, housing prices tanked and. Tens of thousand people leave town. And <laughs> there were supposed to be three reactors. There were supposed here, to be right? three, right. right? The remnants of the other two are still out there. Yeah. In fact, I've been involved in numerous visits out there of saying, "What else could we do with these things?" Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's all kinds of pumps and piping, and we were looking at it for additional test facilities. Uh, oh, okay. But because uh, they, they just walked away from construction, right? Yeah. When, the, when it defaulted. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, several, several monuments to stupidity out there. So uh. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's, oh, that's good. I, lo I love hearing about these things from people. That oh yeah, out it, there you know, it, it, you can imagine the being an engineer out there working on getting a new reactor online and say, "Oh, never mind. You can go home. We aren't going to do that now." Yeah. Uh, that's hard on people. Right. You know, you commit your lives to it and. Uh, now you got to go find something else to do. Right, and you, you wonder if that's really the best physical choice. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Because, you know, you spend Well, I mean, uh, in hindsight, would have been better if we had those reactors online and we didn't have to burn as much coal and oil. Uh, <laughs> with now that global warming is the is the, the big concern, I think there might have been some different things done. So, right, uh, yeah. That's kind of always that tension. I know the nuclear industry, that's one of their main talking points you yes. know is, is the um is that it's carbon free yeah and, um, yeah mostly. i mean if my my best example i always bring up is is france i mean they're 85 percent nuclear they've closed the fuel cycle with reprocessing they don't have too much of a concern about generate their carbon footprint in the power production industry uh we could have been there too but uh we made some wrong turns <laughs> so <laughs> I'm wondering, um, if, uh, kind of two questions, uh, uh, back to back, kind of one's a flip of the other. Um, what were the most challenging aspects of your work at Hanford over your 35 years? Challenging aspects. Oh. Oh, it, because we're a research institution, we're always doing things for the very first time. Uh, Anytime you have to invent the hardware to do the research, uh, that's that's the next. You know, you can't just open up a catalog and order three of item A and three of item B and go do your test. You have to design it first, and uh, that puts a lot of pressure on you. And when the the budgets are fixed and the schedules are fixed, and you got to come up with an answer. Uh, that's In fact, the a lot of the stuff you're building then gets later. Oh, in the oh yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, we, we generated quite a number of patents and so forth in the process of, of building these things. But, but nobody ever factors in the fact that this has never been done before and you want me to give you a fixed budget and a fixed schedule to get this job done. Uh, I found that tough. Uh, right. and, I, and I'm sure people today are still challenged with the same difficulties. Of, uh, Everybody wants to know when you're going to be done and how much it's going to cost. Are <laughs> any notable successes or failures in that aspect of kind of building this hardware for the first time? Oh, you learn a lot from your failures. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is, is, there, is there an example that comes to mind? Oh, um, well, the one I always remember that was kind of traumatic to me was, you know, I mentioned those sapphire windows we were building. I was doing a test for basic energy sciences in Washington, D.C., trying to understand a, a basic concept called thermal non equilibrium vapor generation. This is where, for example, in a reactor blowdown condition where you superheat a liquid, and you want to understand how that, the process of that turning to flashing to steam. Well, I had to get uh, visible access to uh, my blowdown uh, uh, Venturi nozzle and I built one of these sapphire windows. It was about 20 inches long, three inches wide. Cost me, I forget what the number was, $60,000 a copy for these windows. Wow. I took it out of the box, 
we had special silver plated gaskets designed. We put it on there, put the frame on, tightened the two first two bolts, cracked it right in the middle. <laughs> 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 I went down. First I went home because I was done for the day. Right, right. <laughs> the next day I come back and I went down and talked to our uh, uh, machinist down in the optical shop and I says, I forget his name, I think his name was Doug. What can we do here? He says, well, I can take those two broken pieces and turn them into two smaller windows. So I went back and redesigned the test section with two small frames. It was cheaper to rebuild the metal parts than it was the, the windows. And we made that one window into two small windows proceeded to get the test done but uh, <laughs> but uh, those, those are the kind of days where you go yeah we should have checked the dimensions on that uh, retainer before we tried the assembly right and, you know I trusted that the shop had had got them right and they were slightly off wow. and, uh, so you learn lessons there. Yeah. I never broke another window. <laughs> so, I bet. <laughs> Not at 60,000 a pop. No. <laughs> what, were, um, what, were, what were the most rewarding aspects about, about your work? Oh, what, what I found was coming to work every day uh, at Mattel, you're always working on something different. I mean, I, I didn't get stuck in a rut. For example, Boeing made me a job offer that was very lucrative, but I found out I would be designing landing gear struts. And I thought, could I do that for 30 years? I don't think so. Is this at the beginning of your? Yeah, this has uh, been in my career. The reason I went to work for Patel uh, is because of the variety of the work they were doing. Mm -hmm. And my, my example I always used to tell our, when we, when we were actively hiring and bringing uh, interview candidates through, as I said, uh, as simultaneously I was working on liquid metal fast breeder reactors and peanut dryers. I worked half the week on peanut dryers and half the week on uh, fast we, breeder reactors. Like for industrial, yeah, for like exactly. agribusiness to Who, dry peanuts. Yeah, like, you know, salted in the shell peanuts. Getting the moisture out of those things is a difficult job, and especially trying to do it uh, and conserve electricity and, and natural gas in the drying process. So that would have been some of that 1831 work. That's some of that right. 1831 work, yeah. So I had to put, I had to, two different hats. And uh, doing that simultaneously was some kinds of a little traumatic <laughs> to switch <laughs> gears. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, but that kept it, kept it interesting. There wasn't a day I didn't come to work where I thought there's something interesting to do today. And uh, there's not many jobs you can have that are that way. So, That's great. So, uh, uh, in fact, I I uh, shed a few tears when it came time to retire. So, <laughs> yeah. So I want to ask you about that. So you, you retired in two thousand eight, and yeah. what what was the impetus for? You're, you're still well, a young guy. What was what was? Well, the, my wife and I love to travel. Uh, we've been to Europe, I don't know, eighteen times. And we love the history and that. And uh, trying to squeeze that in with a forty to sixty hour work week is pretty tough to do. Right. So when we first got married, we uh, said. Let's set our objective on trying to retire early so we can do some things while we're young enough to enjoy it. Right. So it was tough. I had two sons and trying to put all that money away and meet that objective to retire early was tough. We, we stayed in our old house and didn't upgrade to a new and bigger house like everybody else, but we, we made it. And uh, best decision I ever made. So. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, so, do you do you miss the work sometimes? Oh yeah, that? yeah. In yeah. fact, uh, back a few years ago, I was kind of hoping to go back to work, but the rules were that I couldn't go back before age sixty-two. Once I once I took the retirement package, mm -hmm. they had they had rules in their contract that they couldn't rehire retirees. Those have since been changed. I could work now, but uh, we're kind of lacking in experimental facilities out here now that I would be interested in in uh, working on. I still tell my old section manager that if you ever get the budget to rebuild some experimental facilities, I'd be happy to come out and help. <laughs> <So> <laughs> but just don't ask me to write a safety plan. So. Right. <laughs> so. Oh, red tape. So, um, so I, I, uh, I just, I guess, uh, mm, two questions okay. uh, left. Um, I'm wondering if you could describe the ways in which security or secrecy about what you were doing at Hanford impacted your work? Oh, I mean, uh, secrecy, uh, 
when I first hired on out there, it was still very much us. Everybody out there had a cue clearance in those days. I right. Mean, uh, and we worked on some things that we couldn't write papers on, and you know we were doing a lot of leading edge stuff, but uh, we didn't get go off to the conferences and present our our findings. Uh, we got involved in the treaty and production, you know, supporting production. That was a very big project, but boy, very closely controlled. Classified computers, classified phone lines, classified fax machines. I mean, communications were very tightly controlled. So, what, did, what did you do for the Tritium project? Oh, I was, there were some thermal aspects that our group got involved in. I mean, I can't, even now, I can't talk about a lot of this stuff. So sure. <laughs> I mean, just because I retired, it doesn't King's X my security requirements. So right. uh, right. Uh, <laughs> uh, we worked on some stuff for the military that related to weapons. We worked on stuff for uh, kinetic projectiles. I mean, this is <laughs> uh, really interesting stuff. Made my day, but uh, we couldn't go out and write papers about it and put it out in the general literature. So. Uh, uh, it's it's much different than a university environment where it's publish or perish. Right. If we published, we'd perish. perish. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, uh, and a lot of people we hired, we we hired some uh, re not retired but professors that wanted to come work in research. It it wasn't an easy transition for them to come into the environment of the classified environment, where you have to be so careful. Uh, and uh, we had a couple of people that just never did make the transition, so. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's still a constant um, tension within university research. Oh, yeah. When it deals with, for Army Mill applications, yep. things that are export controlled. Yep. There's always that, the export control office fights with the, you yep. know, and, the, and how freely, and, and that's, yep. you know, kind of tugs at the essential purpose yeah. of the university which is to create and disseminate information yeah. and you know yeah that's I got a little exposed to that as a, a undergraduate research assistant up at WSU uh, Professor Clayton Crow up there was working on some uh, experimental simulations of uh, underwater rocket launches related to ICBM launches from su from submarines right. and we were trying to mock up some of that stuff you know I got a, a briefing on how much we could say and couldn't say about some of this stuff we were working on and, yeah uh, I kind of that was kind of my introduction to working in a in a it wasn't wasn't what I'd call classified but was certainly sensitive information sure. so uh, uh, and uh, I, I I was able to handle it I, I tried to take more as much satisfaction I could from just what I was personally working on I, I didn't want to resume building wasn't what I was after sure. so uh, some people don't have that same priorities, I guess. Uh, it's, they want to make themselves look good rather than just enjoy the work they're doing. So, uh, uh, I mean, publishing is still encouraged, highly encouraged. That's that's the only way we really got of advertising our capabilities out here. Right. So, uh, so I published kind of attention there too. Oh right? yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, over the years, I probably published 20, 30 papers and and enjoyed going off to the conferences and interacting with our with our uh, peers. At and learning new things. Uh, for example, go, there was an L, a yearly LDA symposium held in Portugal, and uh, we usually had somebody there for about the first five or six years that uh, that conference was held, because we were doing leading edge stuff, and uh, it was fun to share the information with people. So, uh, it's probably fun to go to Portugal too. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there's worse places in the world. Yeah. In th the first time I went over there, uh, it was really interesting. Uh, bottle of water was a nickel and a beer was a nickel. So you can guess which one I draw. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, so my, <laughs> my last question, uh, or was not like on your off time, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, in fact, we went over and did the, the conference was over the 4th of July holiday. I actually presented my paper to an audience of 2,000 people on the 4th of July. So I took a comp day the next day and we went and toured Lisbon. So, yeah, that's fun. That's fun. <laughs> so my, my last question is, um, I, what, what would you like future generations to know about working at Hanford and living in Tri-Cities during the Cold War? 
you know, being being a lifelong resident of the Tri Cities, I've I've not known any different. Uh, it's not like there was any kind of uh, trauma involved with moving here and seeing the big nuclear symbols and the Richland bombers, and that's just normal to me. I mean, uh, and it's, I think, if I were to tell somebody, it's a, it's a very stable community, it's a very healthy community, there's a lot of interesting things going on, and what we're doing out here uh, has the ability to diversify into many different areas that uh, make a difference. So. Uh, I'm, I'm sure by the time we're done with the VIT plant 50 years out in the future, we're going to be doing some things with that technology that will impact commercial aspects of the, our economy in all kinds of ways. Mm. But uh, this is lead, when you do leading edge, leading edge stuff, you make a difference. So uh, that's, I guess that would be a short summary. And, no, uh, great, I think there's you. a lot of personal satisfaction in that. So. Uh, like I said, with, when we were doing the early days of LDA, when it, it was an idea that came out of the uh, University of Minnesota, and we got one of their uh, uh, PhDs to come out here and go to work for us, bring that knowledge, and we continued to develop it and make it better. And it eventually became a, a commercial market, uh, selling literally hundreds of these systems to research institutions all around the country. There's a lot of satisfaction in that, so uh, sure. it goes from a from a concept to a standard tool, and uh, that's where I got my kicks anyway. So <laughs> that's great. Well, Jim, thank you so much for, yeah. for coming and talking about your work. It was, okay, it was really it was really amazing. Okay, great thank you. Show. Yeah, awesome. Go Cougs. <laughs> yeah. Go Cougs.